was a great intro. Some of it was even true. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's a fine city. And I realized I made one really big mistake. I didn't burn any city. I threw it hard to spring. And I'm going to try to get down there. That is amazing. And, and, and indeed, I had no real appreciation for the significance of water here. I'll go away with that. Insight into place. And try and share insight into place with you, my place, Vancouver. Now, here's the problem. I got way too much material. So I tried to figure out how to structure it, basically just to tell you the story. The story. So, once upon a time. That time. That time. All right, 1948. Ah. Now, that is it only before you were born, it was before I was born. So this incident that happened has kind of disappeared from memory. And yet, at the time, it was the greatest natural disaster that had occurred in Canada to that day. It was a very long, cold winter. And up in the mountains of the Cordillera, peak after peak after peak, the snows accumulated late, late into the spring until May, where it suddenly it turned very warm. And so torrents, really rivers of water rushed off of these slopes into the great collector of the Simon Fraser River. Down into the delta between these mountains, and there it broke the banks. Now, there weren't a lot of people living in British Columbia. I doubt there was much more than a million. And it was still, to some degree, an agrarian province. So, this was wrong. The city of Vancouver was cut off from the rest of Canada, except by air. For two weeks, the army came in. Tens of thousands of people had to be evacuated. And about, I think, a year to a half of the war mainland was underwater. This is not something that you forget. It was truly a catastrophe. And you know the line about catastrophes, you never waste a good one. That's what politics comes to. And this is actually the interesting part of the story. It was one guy in particular who understood that because of catastrophe, it would be possible to do the next day what it would have been impossible to do the day before. And here's another interesting insight. I've never had a picture of it. Well, I haven't tried very hard, I'll be honest, but I haven't found anyone on the internet, so uh, these days, if it ain't digital, it's almost not real. You've got to find a picture of Tom. Not many people know about him or remember him. He's what we call a red Tory. I don't think that's a term you would use in the States. So it would be kind of like, uh, to go back, a Rockefeller Republican. It would be a, a, someone who's socially progressive, maybe fiscally conservative. It's an unusual hybrid, and in politics today, you don't find many of these guys, but Tom was one of them. And he was a backroom boy. He did the deals. He got, in this case, the premier elected. So Tom could say, you know, I'm interested in this, and the people who could make it happen were very interested in that. And it was what Tom wanted that makes this so interesting. He was one of the first members of the Community Planning Association of Canada that had just been formed. Where that interest came from, I have no idea. But Tom realized because of that flood, it would be possible to do something that, hmm, politically, most of the people in power wouldn't have thought was a good idea. Which is that you'd tell people what they could do with their land. And if that land was in a floodplain, you'd be telling them what they could. And what Tom wanted was what became the first regional transportation authority, maybe in Canada, certainly in British Columbia, and a very unusual thing. This idea that you would look at the land from the Pacific Ocean down into the East Coast Mountains and you would deal with it as one. And you would think about it strategically. Now that's not unprecedented in America, interestingly. And Tom actually went to the Tennessee Valley Authority to find the kind of bureaucrat that he would want to be the first handful of people to be the Lower Mainland Regional Planning Board. And what they came up with was the first vision <coughs> of my region, actually more than it, looking into the future, way into the future, way to 1990. 
And the guy from the Tennessee Valley Authority came up with six words that captured that vision. Cities in the sea of cream. That that natural environment we lived in was so visible, the mountains and the water. If, if, he said, you could save the parts that flooded and with some of the best agricultural land in Canada, if you could save that, there's a little phrase here, land to be saved if possible. And the bureaucrat puts the words in, if possible into a document. You know, politicians, that's up to you. And what is astonishing is they did. It took a while, it took a few decades, but the first plan of any note evolved into this. The most important land use decision in British Columbia's history. We had a social democratic government in power, and I don't even think what they did. They quite realized the consequences of it. But a deputy minister convinced his minister, and the minister brought it in before the rest of the government even realized what they were doing, and they stuck with it, plus by the soils, and said to all the municipalities, hands off. You don't get development. For a large part of the province, that wasn't consequential, but here, when you were dealing with a very limited land base, you were saying effectively, not only are you bounded by the mountains and the water, you can't argue with those, you're going to be bounded by all of the agricultural land, which would be the cheapest and most accessible land that you can develop. And that's our reality. So, the mountains and the water. Look, you've only got this little narrow slice of the pie that you can go out onto. And when you do, Agricultural land. And, oh, the best salmon stream on the planet. Now, on one hand, same here, is this love affair that you have with your environment. The beauty of the place, the power of the landscape. Your politicians are reflect with that. And lady. But, ah, uh, it's money. It's value. It's growth. That tension. That tension is more real here than almost anywhere else in North America. Yes, they're running down to places San Francisco and arguably Manhattan, New York, but, but this is a fast growing young city and this is a very radical thing to do. Even more radical when you consider what we are doing as a civilization. In 1956, you more than most, but almost every place has this once they have the resources to do it. Your technology is what you do to tap resources, mobilize them, so that you can overcome the constraints of nature. What happened in 1956? This is really important to you. This is your history now. This has shaped your world. You would be different people if this hadn't happened. Your economy would be different, and your cities would be immediately different. Yeah. Federal Aid Highway Act. 1956. Look at that, sir. Now, it's preceded by a lot of other stuff. I don't want to exaggerate too much, but it's a great story. And I don't think you can find anything more significant than the interstate freeway system as a single work of engineering in human history. Pyramids, Great Wall of China, Roman roads and aqueducts. Ah, this is 44,000 miles, coast to coast, border to border, many times over, in a network. And you can do it all without ever going through a stop sign. Engineered, so you can do it safely at 100 miles an hour. This is absolutely astonishing. And done so quickly. Everything changed because of it. The economy and culture, freedom, movement, certainly the shape of cities. Now, in Vancouver, same year, our informative document, <laughs> informative, oh yeah, informs everything. This is only a development file. And for the first time, we have one now, in one place, as people understand zoning and development. And he did one key thing. They allowed this. The rezoning of a whole old streetcar suburb. This would be like taking, well, what do you think, Hyde Park? No, bigger. And allowing this. So here we see Corbusier meets, I think, British public housing, basically the North European sensibility on how things could be built. There's a lot of reinterpretation that this comes out of Hong Kong. Not true. It really is the consequence of two or three key things. 
reinforced concrete, the high speed electric elevator, and a way of pouring concrete so that you can do it in platforms. And having a labor force that can do it. So you can turn this stuff out by the week. And once you've got what the city will allow, and you can acquire the land to do it, there is an explosion of film. Well, let me show you. So this is my neighborhood, and this is what it looked like in 1956, and this was the tallest building, an old street car apartment building of eight stories. Ah. Ten years later, just ten years, I'm pretty sure the city council in 1956, when they passed that, best advice of their staff, had no idea. If someone had shown them this, and then this, well, and then this, <laughs> And that's pretty much what it looks like today. There it is. That's, that is my neighborhood. And imagine all of those towers, there's hundreds of them there, all built within about a 10 to 15 year period. Well, you can imagine the shock. And it was so great that the city I grew up in, Victoria, the mayor, took an image like that on the back of a telephone book, put it up on his office wall so he could point to it and say, that will never happen to Victoria. <laughs> go to Australian cities and you can find one of these towers in neighborhoods and you know what happened. That one tower went up and people said, Run, no more of that. Yeah, one of those suckers is all you need to completely reverse and maybe <laughs> remove a council. And you can kind of understand why because it didn't have a very good rep. Architecturally, it was probably the nadir of design. I mean, these are stripped down boxes. And they paved over the site for her. This is the minimum you could do that the city would allow. <laughs> and the social consequences of it, well, there's a little looking back now. <clears throat> One architectural critic said the demolition of Pruitt Igo, the St. Louis housing project, happened live on TV. This is the end of modernism. Well, it was certainly the end of the idea that you could build a kind of utopian city, Corbusier City, <coughs> and that echoes through to today. There's just a general sense that height equals density. Height equals density. And density <coughs> equals social dysfunction. Right? In fact, sometimes you don't even have to have the conversation. I know as a city councilor sitting in a public hearing, uh, yeah, that, that's just kind of silly. You don't have to explain it. You sure you know that, council. Density, density is a bad thing. It's going to bring traffic, maybe the other, and a whole bunch of stuff. So why are you doing it? And because towers are very visible, they become symbols. Well, you can imagine the symbol is put the West End. So great was it that in 1972, the council changed, the ones that had approved all of this stuff, gone. And for about another 15 years, we never built another residential highway. Now the other thing was that these were all rental. There was no such thing as condominiums. Legally, you couldn't sell off little concrete boxes in the sky. So the social class of who lived in high rises, they were renters, as many of you probably are. And from the point of view of homeowners, those people have little or no commitment to the community. It doesn't matter whether that's true or not. I don't believe it is. But it was strong enough of a feeling at that time for a whole era to end and another to begin. So this was the city more or less as it stopped in 1972. That's a little later, but generally true. This, as it happened, became the walking city. The densities were high enough, and we'll get into a little bit more of the detail as to why that became the dominant mode of transportation. But the rest of the city, almost immediately beyond those boundaries, it was what it had been built as. Now you might think that's the car, but it isn't. It's the streetcar. I'd love to get into some of the detail on the streetcar. It is a revolutionary form of technology. Richmond, Virginia, 1887, a guy named Frank Sprague not only resolved the problems of the streetcar, but had a company that actually would go into cities and build them for them. And after that, 1887, certainly by 1890, which I believe is the date where probably the streetcar started running down Guadalupe. 
I can come into a city. We were doing that today. Ah, speaker. Yes, no. I'll tell you why. But here's the layout. It's a uh, hub and spoke. Everything's still centered into the city. And the streets are now being laid out because, and if there's one thing I can leave you with more than any other, is that transportation is about land use, and land use is about real estate, and real estate is about making money. So you put all those together in one handy package, you can realize why. You have to understand these things together, even though we always separate them out. Got your engineers over there. You got your clients and architects over here. We'll talk engineering, we'll talk land use, we'll talk transportation, and you shouldn't, but we do. Nonetheless, here you can see the power of it. these streets being laid out for the streetcar lines. They were essentially real estate plays. The subdivisions, streetcar subdivisions, certainly Hyde Park, north of the university, laid out as a single vision, connected to the rest of the city. And where you found the streetcar, you found opportunity to sell people things. Typically, the streetcar suburbs were designed so that no more than about three blocks, every three blocks, then another three blocks, every <coughs> streetcar, half a mile separation. Because you could take a streetcar and you'd be home by now. So where you stopped, you could buy and sell. No zoning. These streets evolved comfortably because they made sense. And so there it was, transportation, a mix of uses, residential, commercial, the density is high enough, even as a suburban form, a suburban form, these are the first suburbs. And they created these streetcar villages, which are incredibly resilient. They rise, they fall, they change, new immigrant groups come in, others leave. But you can't really kill them. Tough to do. And if they are anchored by something, oh, I don't know, like a university. My goodness. Guadalupe, is that how you pronounce it? Guadalupe, Guadalupe? Can you imagine U of T without Guadalupe? It's just an essential mix here. And I've only been here for a few hours. I just know. That place is as important culturally to this campus as any other cultural facility that you have. And it provides you with services. And I think you are almost that close to getting a version of the streetcar one down there. Still talking about that? No, not anymore? Not really? Really? <laughs> Still talking? <laughs> See what you can do on that. <laughs> it was what created it. And it's what gives it still some strength. You know, people get a little romantic about the idea of the streetcar rails and that kind of thing. A good bus system can do the same basic function, but there is nothing that can substitute for this particular combination of the walking streetcar village transportation and this mix of retail with enough population living nearby so that the retail village has its own domestic market in addition to the regional one that will be attracted to it because of its particular character. This is the world of 3 to 30 miles an hour. It's actually the way human beings have built in building cities, most of the human experience with this addition of having the technology to go a little faster. Here you can see the transition. It was originally on Denman Street, my streetcar village, uh, residential street. And then in 1900, the streetcar came down. So here you see people built little storefronts in their front yard. Now, this is illegal. <laughs> if you come up to the city and you say, I'd like to do just this again. No, absolutely not. <laughs> Go away. Why? What's missing? What would be absolutely essential, required? Parking. Parking. No parking? Can't hold that. No parking. Show me your parking bylaw. Don't want to exaggerate too much, but I think I can say it. Show me your parking bylaw and pretty much guess what your city looks like. And that is why it's very hard to do this kind of thing. By 1964, we're into the next phase. Because what I talk to you is about the city that we don't actually build anymore. We have versions of it. The urbanism tries to do it. But just as the parking has changed, it, so is this. That infrastructure now that Canada is beginning to build, very much modeled after the American state system, is again making land use changes <coughs> on a truly regional 
scale that is transforming what it means to live in a city. So what is that? It's our version of the interstate, the Trans-Canada Highway. We have a different system. We don't have a highway trust fund. Trans-Canada is the only federal highway that's funded. The rest is provincial. But leaving that aside, the idea is basically the same. The senior governments spend billions to build the big stuff. And then the consequences are dealt with by the cities. We then adapt their bylaws and requirements to accommodate the traffic that can now move at 60 kilometers an hour, increasingly across ever-growing regions, so they can acquire the best, possibly the best, existence that human beings have ever had. Because any culture that gets rich enough to do it, does it. Today, you can go to suburbs of Shanghai, and you would have a tough time telling them apart from some of the suburbs of Vancouver. And some of them are even named after that. People like the idea of having their own home on their own lot, separate from every other, everybody doing the same. So what's, what do you need for this? Uh, actually, quite a few important things. Cheap, secure energy. Thank you, Texas. <coughs> Abundant service land. This is where constraints come into it, don't they? The technology, though, makes it possible to now expand your region much, much more quickly. Get to that cheaper line, assuming you have it. And it's the job, ha, it's really my job, and I saw a council to provide the servicing end of it. That's what basically municipal and regional government are ahead of. Water, for one thing. Water. No water, no city. Cut your water off, you're out of business. Watch Sao Paulo. It may be the first time we've seen a city of that size run out of water. There was a piece in the Times just the other day, one of the people, <laughs> I think it was the water board, saying, you know, we might be down to the point where we're going to have to tell people to flee. Flee. That was the word he used. Whoa. However, we are do such a good job of it, such a great job of it. Let me say on behalf of government, <laughs> we're awfully good at this stuff. How much does it cost you uh, for your water here? How much did this cost? About dollar fifty. Am I right? Somewhere yeah. there. Uh, double this, about a liter. A thousand of these liter bottles. A thousand. Fill up a good part of this room. The water district that I was a board member of wholesaled it for 15 cents. A thousand liters. I think it's up to about 25, 30 cents. Now that you get the point, it might as well be free, and that's how people see it. And it doesn't kill you. That's a very big deal. It hasn't been true for a good part of human history. But if it did, if anyone died because of the water that comes out of your taps, it, there would be a brutal political price to pay. It so rarely happens, we don't even think about it. Remarkable, but we need it, and we got it. Low cost money. And the technologies and the organizations that make it all work, that's you. That's what you're part of. You're part of the organizations who train you for this, who educate you for this, who'll be hired for this, to make all this work. And we've done such an amazing job of it for at least half a century that it's now considered an entitlement. And people are, in fact, living on the capital that the previous generation <coughs> put in to make all of this possible. They don't even think they have to maintain it because they've had it so good for so long. And they're certainly expecting it to continue. But they will not be happy if they don't see that. So this has actually been a pretty good deal. And I think it's almost been a unique moment in human history where it's all come together at a time of political stability and wealth. So we'll see how long that plays out. But man, it's been an amazing run while it's happened. And it has generated this particular archetypal form of architecture. <coughs> Again, the land is really the key point, and then the infrastructure, it's all the pipes underneath all of this that really make it work, and then the roads on top of it, and then all this can happen. And it's really terrific. And I think almost all of you grew up in it. Anybody not grew up in a single family house here? One? Okay. Um, I do this pretty typically, maybe one or two, right? Uh, yeah, that's about it. You know nothing else. 
So the idea of the multiple family dwelling is a singular cultural challenge because not enough people have had the experience with it to know how to do it really well. We go to cities, particularly when we travel, to experience it. But there's a certain sense of artificiality in that. And, I, and I, I'm sure it's the same here. When you suggested that multiple family be introduced into this, we were dealing with a pretty difficult issue that's often unstated. The problem with it is, if there is a single problem, it's this. The residential part delivers what people want. They're not overly enthusiastic about this. <coughs> oh, no. No, really? Not 30 minutes. <laughs> I'm only. OK, I'll go as long as I can. <coughs> a, this is not what you take guests from out of town to show them, because this is what you're proud of. B, this is not what you're going to be putting heritage plaques on, for two reasons. You don't love it. And C, you don't expect it to be around. There isn't anything in that picture, except for the road itself and the high rises in the distance, it's going to be around for 30 years. Nobody thinks it will. And if somebody went in today and bulldozed all of this stuff, it's true, no one would care. Now, we get up and do it all again. Yes, there's economic consequences to that, but in terms of this relationship that you have with your city, it's disposable. So here's the dilemma. We're actually building cities that we really, really do like a lot, and we're building cities we don't give a damn about. And that really did have to change in some way, and it's about this time when it starts to happen, and it's certainly true here. There are typically, every city I go to, you can name an issue that occurred sometime in this period from about 68 to 72, where there was something that captured the moment. Here, it's all about the, the salamanders. That, that was just what was needed to make the kind of change that became reflective of what the cities wanted to be that was different from the way they were going. And for us, it was this. It was fully expected that we too, like the Americans, would build out the highway system so that the freeways would come into the heart of the city. Well, that just kind of makes sense both in and out. We wanted to get people out to the, the safe and the green and the good schools and the aspirational qualities of the suburbs in their cars. Downtowns would, of course, stay alive. So the department stores were in the cultural centers and the office buildings. But you had to get them in and out. And you had to do it seamlessly, which meant that you had to bulldoze anything that didn't meet that criteria that was in the way. And what was in the way? The street their suburbs. And so down they came, or at least, that's what the planners intended. The entire east end of the city would be bulldozed and replaced with public housing at the same time. The connecting route would be made for the transit of the I-35. And in particular, they loop around the city, and then they access their department. And it all seemed to, well, it was very aspirational. And we were going to do it from every direction that you could possibly imagine. <laughs> I mean, why wouldn't you? We had I-5 and I-9, Highway 99 coming in from the south, the Trans-Canada. Uh, well, you would have to do that, and then you would do the loop around the city, and at the same time, you could clear out all the blight, uh, do the office towers. This is modeled after San Francisco and Barcadero Center, and what's not to love? The people could come in on the elevated freeway along the waterfront, right into the parking garages, the pedestrian plazas on top, the sparkling brand new office towers, progress. And we didn't build a bit of it. The rejection of the freeways was part of it. You would have to see Alan and look what they did with I-5. And said, this is not what the railways really look like. And by that time, there was enough people who realized that the loss of these old streetcar neighborhoods, as well as the social injustice, because typically the poorest ones were the first to go. It's still true today, by the way, that the missing pieces of the yellow book, the additional freeways that were added to the interstate system are the ones that we've gone through areas like Northwest Washington or Beverly Hills or places like that. You know the conclusion you can draw. But in Vancouver's case, we built none of it. And so what would have been under concrete became the opportunities for the next generation. That really is kind of the story of Vancouver, is taking these old industrial sites, these rail yards, the freeways they would have been used for the freeways, 
and doing a completely different vision based on the particular experience that we had had by building multiple family on this truly astonishing scale. So we had enough people who knew how to live in it, even raise children, and certainly find a, an attractive and affordable form of housing at a particular stage in their lives. A half century of urban innovation. Starting here on the south shore of the creek, the city acquired the old industrial lands and cleared them off and built the anti West End. This is Christopher Alexander Land. For those of you who know it, this is pattern language. So these are the ideas of the, of the 70s realized in a single project that the city was basically in charge of. Owned the land, still leases it. It was no roads along the waterfront. It was mixed abuses, mixed of incomes. It was places for children. It was very, very green in the sense of a lot of park and open space. By 1976, that had evolved to the point where we were confident we could go back to using an urban form that we had for the previous 15 years. And we had the opportunity, because the site that had been used, you can still see here, in about 1983, there are log booms in False Creek. The stadium had been built, but the old rail yards by this time had been gone, and it was an opportunity to do a mega project not in this case owned by the city, but effectively controlled by it. At one of these moments that you don't get very often, Hong Kong is going to be reunited to China. And so, strategically, it was a good time for Chinese to do something they had for about half a millennium, which is to look across the Pacific and see maybe what the opportunities were there. I was telling Robert about the story, one of the greatest in history. So when the West showed up, the Europeans, when they showed up in my part of the world, upper right-hand corner of the Pacific in the late 1700s, they all did at the same time. The Russians, the Spanish, the French, the British, even the Americans. Where were the Chinese? Why weren't they already there? In the early 1400s, well before Columbus, they had the largest ocean-going fleet of boats the world had ever seen until World War I. But they didn't. Until right about then. Don't want to exaggerate too much, by the way. My city is just made up of immigrants, because hardly anyone has had more than two generations there. And people from Asia come from lots of different places. So you can exaggerate. But the single reason this happened was because Li Ka Sheng, Hong Kong billionaire, his son actually, Victor, realized this was an opportunity. And they were prepared to play by the rules of the city, which is that we were going to leave her out in return for a lot of residential density, everything that we thought would comply with the price of complete community. And it would have to be done at the developer's expense. Well, expense. That would have to be included in their performance. They were going to make a lot of money if all this work, but they would have to take that risk. And the city was going to extract these conditions. So, 50 acres apart, the community center, the school site, some of this changed, but basically we extracted about half a billion dollars out of this process. And, here was a deal. We could say to the people in the community, we are not going into your neighborhoods to accommodate growth, but in return you are going to have a seawall, a parks, all of the infrastructure, additional amenities, at no cost to you. We're not going to the tax code. This will be extracted out of the growth process. Growth pays for growth. That, that was the most significant political thing that was done because we could. It was this moment of growth, all of this pent-up demand that had been occurring since the rejection of growth in the 1970s. You've got some of that here. Had to be accommodated, and we had this combination of circumstances, and did not, I mean, it was did not have to go into the existing neighborhoods to do it. Because for my sense of being here for a day, it's an issue. It's tough. Hi. I'm a city. I'm here to change the character of your neighborhood. How would you like us to do that? Here's another thing. As the rate of change slows down, people's perception of change increases. That paradox actually does make sense. If growth is stopped and you stay in one place long enough, you no longer see buildings coming down or new subdivisions going in. You see trees grow. You get to know people in the social fabric. Somebody cuts down a tree, paints their house a bright color. That's a big deal. 
And so the time comes when you have to accommodate growth. When someone is proposing a change of scale, and it can be very small. What does this mean? What does that precedent imply? Well, you'd better assure me that what I develop is not going to be negatively affected before I accede to what you want. That's almost impossible to me. At least at the early stages. And then there's the irony. The change starts. And it happens, and then people get used to that. They even get used to a rapid, more rapid rate of change. And so what was traumatic at the beginning becomes a kind of new norm later on. But to get there, that's the tough part. We were doing it on this extraordinary scale because we could. We had the land. We weren't going into the existing neighborhoods. We were extracting the benefits. And we were beginning to use the technologies now of our time. Yep, still reinforced concrete and high-speed electric elevators. We now new forms of glass and new forms of tenure and different ways of design. This is where the architects really came into their own at this point. There's a certain generic quality to that, no doubt. You've got an awful hard <coughs> green glass. But the form itself became known as Vancouverism because it was a particular matching of urban design and architecture. Point towers, small floor plates, and the idea of the scissor stair. So, architects, here's your time. These are relatively small buildings. I've been kind of amazed when I got on the street view and heard you were doing towers in Austin, and I had no idea. I realized that they were as big as they are. These are big suckers. We don't do them that big. <laughs> These are kind of mini high-rises. And very small floor plates, around 15,000 square feet. Well, for a bunch of reasons, the kind of zoning of land, the FSR, the FAR, floor area ratio. Uh, but basically, to maximize the views and to simplify the internal circulation to maximize the efficiency of the floor plan. Am I talking your language? Mm -hmm. Talking real estate. How can I maximize the efficiency of the floor plate? That is, every square meter, every square foot, uh, I can sell rather than have to use for circulation and utilities. So that's important. There must be an animated use to the exterior of the building at the street level. This is straight out of Jane Jacobs. Eyes on the street. But more importantly, you've got to have some kind of mix. You have to have a variety of different forms of expression. So whether they be townhousing or retail, no blank walls. No blank walls. In some cases. And the parking has to be done in such a way that it is not the visible form. No parking above the street. No. Underground. And once you force the parking underground, now you are talking about today in the range of forty to eighty thousand dollars a parking space. A single space. And the developers start getting very interested in whether it's possible to reduce the number of parking spaces that are needed. <laughs> Rather than telling you, I can't sell a building unless it has the parking, they're saying, hmm, would you be willing to, say, reduce the amount of parking if I put in, say, a shared vehicle? Right. Is there another way we can do this? I see we have transit here. Maybe that. Maybe I can get that down. We well, can eliminate a, a whole layer of parking. Millions and millions and millions of dollars. These are open pit mining operations into which you are pouring money. And man, they get very motivated. From my point of view, great. They're on my side. Uh, this is again Jane Jacobs, eyes on the street, separate entrances, all this good stuff, short blocks, next to you. Oh, yeah. Okay. And then we went at it. <laughs> This is working pretty well. Everybody's on side. Neighborhoods seem to be okay with it. Developers love it. We're accommodating growth. How much can we do with this? Well, we'll start here around Pulse Creek. We'll move to the other side, another rail yard. Uh, God, the parking lots around a hotel. The Japanese just bought them. They realize they're sitting on 50 acres of asphalt. It's getting very entertaining. And then we move into some of the old industrial parcels along some of the spur railways and convert them. We go down to the river. We look at old commercial places that are beginning to deteriorate. Again, we can shift the use here. It's not just to make money. That's a nice side product because it doesn't happen otherwise. But we are accommodating growth by the thousands. I mean, literally thousands of units are coming onto the market every year. It is doing what supply and demand works when 
the supply is high enough. So the people who are moving to the city are not competing with the people already in the existing neighborhoods, particularly the lower middle income renters for whom no one can build. They're not poor enough for social housing. But they're not rich enough to be able to afford new market housing. So they're in these 1960s buildings that were so awful at the time that now it turned out to be a miracle. The plumbing may be dubious, but the price is affordable. And it's concrete. And we've lowered the densities so that you can't tear them down and build anything as big. The developers, the owners, now have an incentive to maintain the building. That's <coughs> actually really key. The best heritage mechanism is to lower the available FSR, FAR, floor area ratio, the density, below the existing building. If you tear that one down, you build something smaller. So we did. This is a shot from above the oh, mid-80s. Let's just take a look at downtown Peninsula. This all happened here at the West End, the neighborhood I lived in. And all of this was done in the time that I was in office. Except for this one, that was already there. Let's take a look at it. This is what it used to be, this is 1985. So these are old warehouses, auto body shops, parking lots, city serving commercial uses. They have a role. And old hotels, SROs, on one of the original streetcar lines. Again, just like the West End. Ah, 10 years later, there's the hotel. And it didn't stop, keeps on going. Keeps on going. That's pretty much it. <laughs> they could go back there. I think that's pretty much it. Now, here's the thing. There's barely enough people in that picture to make viable a medium-sized supermarket. <laughs> because the same thing has happened to these towers as has happened to houses generally. The amount of space that people want and can afford has gone up while the family size has gone down. So you keep having to build more buildings to accommodate the same number of people. Darn. So you've got 1,500 square feet for one or two people. It looks dense, but that's only true for the built area. The population, not so much. And if you don't have a medium-sized full-service supermarket, hello, Whole Foods. You guys know that. You don't have a neighborhood. If I have to drive outside my neighborhood to do grocery shopping, I don't think it's really a neighborhood. I lived in the next neighborhood over, just as it was being built. And until the supermarket opened, it felt like Tempkin Village. The buildings were all up. You had the parks in. It was all very nice. But it didn't seem like a neighborhood. Literally the week the supermarket opened. Then there was a place where you started to have interaction. And I didn't have to go outside my neighborhood for the necessities. And I could walk. So all of the things that we were aspiring to in our plans started to become a reality. By the mid-90s, we began to see the results in a way that nobody had predicted. How am I doing? <laughs> right, right other time. Okay. I'm going to keep going. Because this is really it's directly applicable to you. Here is the key elements of the transportation plan that was passed. I'm glad to say when I was in office, it was in effect. Not a lot, but so. And, well, a lot of people focus on the idea that we're going to have a lot more choice. We're going to focus on transit, and yes, walking, and cycling, all that great stuff. I'm sure it's in your plan. It's in everybody's plans around this time. The most important thing was the first plan, which really I don't think people noticed at the time, because we had already gotten to that point. We had more or less built the city, 44 square miles. If you were going to open up Greenfield sites, it wasn't going to be in Vancouver. Brownfield, yes. Greenfield, done. So the idea that we had to significantly increase road capacity, no. However, even the idea that we would widen roads off the table, and the key thing was that the budgets reflected because here's the truth about politics. Budgets are the sincerest form of rhetoric. I hear what you say. Show me the line items in your budget. Because if you haven't actually reflected your priorities in terms of what you're prepared to spend, or more importantly not, 
and transfer money according to those priorities, it's kind of hard to take you seriously. And I'm pretty sure that the infrastructure budgets for most cities haven't changed a lot. I do remember the one day when um, the engineers wanted to acquire just a corner of a property so that sometime in the future, maybe they could make a connector to allow for a one-way couplet. And the council said, no, we have no intention of doing that. We're not going to do it. We understand your argument. Maybe some council in the future will want to. We're just leaving the options open. Nope. Give the land back. Don't even charge them for it. Remember the face on the engineer? When the culture changes, and the culture in these kind of institutions has to change to reflect that reality, then the other stuff starts to flow. And what was that? Well, I'm going to show you the results first. You saw what happened. We doubled the downtown population. When I moved to the West End in 1978, population on the peninsula was around 40,000. It's easily 100,000 today. It's going for 125,000. That's in two square miles. <coughs> so the number of jobs have also increased. Some mythology that jobs have shifted out, returning Vancouver into a resort city. It's just nonsense. It's amazing how this stuff gets established when the data indicates that I think you're the opposite. Jobs shift, like you. Downtown becomes more of a specialized center. I am corporate, culture, tourism, government, some forms of IT. But the jobs go up. But what happened to the number of vehicles coming in and out of the city? Went down, went way down, even as the number of trips entering downtown went up. Now, we're not counting the people who live downtown and work downtown. Most of them are walking. So not even including them, the number of vehicles, people coming into the downtown to work down. Let me show you more graphic. For those of you in engineering, you'll be familiar with this. It's called a streamline study. Imagine you do them here. You draw a line and you count everything that goes across it in a day. Everything. Okay? So you can see reflected in studies afterwards what happened. Now this is an old plan that was pulled out by a young engineer who got kind of curious about what those streamline studies showed back when they were done in 1676. And here you can see the inbound traffic coming in the morning pretty clearly and then dropping off. Actually, this is completely impenetrable, isn't it? You have to have a, one of these at every power point, I learned. So here is what that inbound traffic looked like in 1960, and again in 1976, it reflects the growth of the city. So what do you think happened in 2010? Because everything that you see in pictures has happened since then. Where will the line be when he grew up? Drew it. Right there. Because traffic coming in out of downtown Vancouver is the same as what it was in 1965, roughly. Which people don't believe. It just doesn't match their perceptions. And it doesn't seem like it could possibly be true. So how do you explain it? Well, it turns out all that nice stuff in the plans and our aspirations you know, the density goes up and the mix of uses and then people have other transportation choices and they stop using cars and stuff. It's true. Now, I wish it were that simple. <laughs> There's a lot of conditions to getting the density right and the transportation choices in a practical way. You've got to have about five of them. I always said it, so let's do it with you. I want five practical transportation choices that allow you to get around in the city. Okay? Go. Give me some. Buses. Buses. Scooters. Like rail? Scooters. Scooters. Safe biking. Biking. Safe. Yeah, you're missing number one. Walking. No. No. Cars. See, everyone's afraid of saying it. Here's number one. It's for most people. It's not going away, and we wouldn't want it to. It's an essential part of the transportation mix. This idea of the car, the war in the car, car's the enemy. No, no, good design, number one. And then, sure, walking, transit, biking. They're not in any particular order. The whole point is you should be able to choose. Match it up. What are you wearing? What are you carrying? Who are you seeing? How far are you driving? Let's see. You get to choose. And mix and match. You get to trick chain. It's a nice day. I'm going five kilometers, three miles. Thank you. No major hills. 
I'm just going grocery shopping. I'm meeting someone at a coffee shop. I'll walk. I'll see you there. Oh, got to drive. So all those things the same day. Taxis, car share. Let's throw in driverless cars. God knows the technology is going to hit us so fast, so hard for the next 10 years. All bets are off. But the one thing that isn't, you got to have choices. And when you do, ta-da! <coughs> You can start doing things with the cheapest real estate that any city has to achieve a whole bunch of other ends. you got the density, but you don't have a lot of parks. Well, put the park in the middle of the street. You may not need it because the traffic is going down. Walking is going up. Or you can take a block out of your arterial grid system. Maybe you can get the transit through it. That's an option. Europeans do it. And you can use it in the summer for put it in the public park. Get it programmed. Music, barbecue, right? What can you do? Because you take it out, and guess what doesn't happen? Congestion. They always predict it will. <laughs> or this. Take parking out and put in little parquets. You guys doing that yet? Really? No? Everybody else is. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> Into New York City? Times Square? Who would have thought? Thank you, Jeanette Sadikon, that you would take Broadway out of Times Square and the uh, traffic would improve. <coughs> right? This is happening all over the world. Bike lanes. Separated bike lanes. Cycle tracks. This is one of the major arterials coming into the city. If you're going to do the screen line study, this is one of the streets you can. With the Olympics, we closed it off. It was right next to the stadium. So we got used to living without any traffic on that street for about two weeks. And so after when the Olympics were over, then the city moved because they could strategically to put, take a whole lane out and put in a bike lane. Guess what's happened to the traffic congestion? Nothing. Same here. Corn is hugely contentious. Just Google that. Uh, I would have conversations with middle-aged men of a certain class and they would turn into these angry, absolutely hysterical teenagers. I mean, it was true. Something had pushed their button. This was not the way things were meant to be. And the predictions, again. We closed off a lane on one of our major bridges. The media were more than ready for the lineups. There was a helicopter in the sky. Some of them had set up live booths ready to go to report on the frustrated and angry commuters who were going to storm City Hall. You can imagine how disappointed they were when it didn't happen. He used to say they didn't report that. However, more and more as we begin to convert, you can see the cycle that begins to happen here. And I'm not joking. I mean, it literally is the cycle of the cycle. More people do start to use bikes, and it's very tough for particularly men of a certain age to imagine this is a serious form of transportation. Let's speed up on the men of a certain age. Because it's true. I run into it all the time. And this is also associated with millennials, so that again adds this whole cultural dimension around it goes. It's just great stuff. I love it. This is what's really interesting. It's when the parking garage owners begin to see that there was a steady decline in the number of people who were coming into the city to park. 25% down, whole floor is empty. And they realized they were sitting on an asset that they could only really capture if they tore the parking garage down. And, you know, build a nice commercial building. Now, parking below it, but not necessarily public parking. Because again, the same thing, it started to happen. People were using transit, they were walking, they were cycling, all of these things were accumulating. And the land value, the underlying land value, could only be realized if you demolished the existing building. And the single use. Let me say that again. The underlying land value could only be realized if you demolished the existing building and rebuilt at a higher density a mix of uses. Because the issue that you're facing, just like us, is that you have a huge stock of older residential buildings that were built in the post-war period, before and after, and they're being demolished. Robert just took me on a tour today. Same in Vancouver. The buildings have to come down because the land values have risen to the point where you can't realize them unless you demolish the existing house. Even if 
even if the house was sizable and suitable, it has to be demolished. It's brutal. But that's the nature of how we realize land value. <coughs> so by the 2000s, transit is really going to have to spec. I'm just going to move real quickly here to show you, because now we go out into the suburbs. And everything that Vancouver has done was beginning to be noticed by the suburbs. So we're beginning also dealing with these regional constraints to realize that they too are going to have to go through the same growth cycle. You can see here the densities. All of those towers, this was taken about 10, 15 years ago. None of them are in Vancouver. That's all along the SkyTrain line, the suburban rail line. And it takes you out into that neighborhood that I showed you, Surrey, if you, the one that had opened up because of the bridge. And it, too, is now going to build a downtown that they expect will be on the scale of neighborhoods like the West End and the Central Business District. That stuff's already under construction. Move their city hall. The whole project's now. Because they are within walking distance of <coughs> rapid transit, frequent rapid transit, stair walk assist, frequency is freedom. This automated system we were one of the first to have a driverless train operates with frequencies as low as 30 seconds. 30 seconds. You see a train leaving the platform, coming into the platform at the bottom of an escalator? Why rush? By the time you get to the top, you can see the next train coming in. That frequency is well, it allows this kind of thing to happen. This was built before the transit, which is now under construction, because they figured it out. The office building, the retail, the condos above, the tower, the parking underground, the mix of uses, the growth consolidated and not moving into the suburbs up there where the people will be very unhappy, but will really like the idea of having this kind of thing that defines their center and gives them the services that they like. <coughs> so by the 2010s, the market fully registered that. Here, well, I should just wait to tell you. This stuff that my generation grew up in, it's coming down to be replaced by this. And here's the interesting thing. It's not necessarily that the number of people living in a bigger house initially will be any larger, maybe even smaller. But the house is designed to be converted into a small apartment. Completely But anybody who's thinking ahead will realize if you're going to move into about the three to 5,000 square feet, it's not staying single family house over the life of the building. Not if your city is having to deal with growth on the scale of places like Austin. They are designed already to be converted into having a suite at least in the basement. And some of the Bathrooms will be constructed in such a way that they can be reconfigured and associated with another part of the house. I don't know if you're doing that here, but this kind of incremental density, visible, hidden, and gentle, is the way that the suburbs are going to evolve. So let me show you quickly. There is the illegal suite. Here is something that was built in about 1965, designed in such a way that there, will, there was a suite built purposely once the, the approval approving officer had left. This was marvelous stuff for the generation of immigrants, particularly coming in from South Asia. That was different families. It was their way of moving into the middle class. Lane cottages all over the city. You take the floor plate of the garage in the back, and you build a living unit of around three to 500 square feet. Sometimes it can get pretty big, depending on the configuration. The general density is what you're doing here. Uh, what's the name of the street we were looking at today? Lamar? South Lamar? Talking about, yeah, you're putting your density on the arterial. Why? Well, that's not what arterials are for. No, people don't want the little arterials. It's the only option you're giving them. Because the neighborhoods behind see them as buffers. Am I being disingenuous? Is that not true? Yeah. That's true. Yeah. No, that's okay. That kind of gentle density will be accepted by the neighborhood behind. And if the arterial itself can be converted into more of a greener street, put in the bike lanes over time, you can allow it to evolve, it can be a very happy place to live. But if it's just another traffic sewer, which you put the density on because it's the only politically expedient way to do it, all right. Think about how it can evolve. 
town housing making this conversion. It's not easy. This is actually pretty technical stuff to figure out how to go from a single separated building to one where you've got common party walls, terrace housing, row housing. This kind of stuff is typical for most of the world. It's where you find it in so many places before the streetcar and the automobile. Going back to something that we jumped right over and never built is actually pretty tricky, but very doable. Finally, yes, finally, uh, it, I wish it were all good news. Uh, Got to be a bit of a <coughs> error at the end, of it, I'm afraid. Because even though the idea of building density along sky train lines is working, here's another major opportunity. The old shopping malls, the dead malls by the thousands, tens of thousands in America, same in Canada, have to be repositioned. And if you have transit, the key, the combination. This is the scale on which we're doing it in Vancouver. Now again, we're used to doing this, so this is not a model that most places are going to accept. It's a kind of new urbanist uh, village idea. Those are popular, and scale's appropriate. But taking that asphalt, again, where you don't have to go into the existing neighborhood, and doing it on the <coughs> scale works for us. This would be a major experiment, and a very large park being created on the top of the boxes below. Hope that works. Same here at Brantwood, 1960s, to become this. So we're building 50, 60 story towers now, the kind of stuff that you have downtown. But these are out in the suburbs along the <coughs> transit line. So there is what I think is probably the logical evolution of the suburbs. The value of the single family residential is not just high economically, it's loved and will be defended. So the political capital that we have to spend to change that is too high to ask the politicians to do it. Until there is a really significant generational change and the land values have gotten high enough so that the market itself begins to drive the change anyway. But the quid pro quo can be that you will take the asphalt, the gray fields, and convert them at a density associated with transit that is really frequent within walking distance. It's just a streetcar and suburb built very large using the high rise as a form for accommodating at least some of the growth that would otherwise have to compete, not actually be affordable, force people either not to come or go away. I think it's the dynamic here. It's the dilemma that you're faced with. Mm -hmm. You got the jobs, the idea of lost them. You're having a tough time, and it's driving up the costs, changing the neighborhoods anyway. But this takes at least some of the pressure. And we have not solved that problem. The demand is still so high that we haven't been able to find a supply mechanism great enough, at least within the short term. This stuff will all have its effect in the long term, but what can you say to the people who are affected by it negatively? So what the city is trying to do is boost the densities to extract value to build the non-market or social or old end of market housing. And that gets pushed back too. And for sometimes good reason. The densities then start to become too great. And the burdens become too high. Fine. I've done that before, but I need it this time. We haven't stopped building the big stuff. There's huge inertia behind this. Huge inertia. The world's biggest industries. Energy, car manufacturing, road building, trucking, a way of life. And they need these billion dollar projects about every 10 years to keep going. You've got to feed them about two to three billion dollars every 10 years. You could do it in the form of transit or bridges, that's a $3 billion bridge, highway expansions, roads to the border, they do it in the name of goods movement, only roads out of greenfield sites, ah, uh, the ALR. So the South Fraser Perimeter Road comes down to feed the port, the coal port. We will take Wyoming's coal and get it through our port in the Pacific Northwest Gulf. We have carbon dealers to the world. And then even the First Nations people are building, because they can malls feeding over the International Freeway, Flyway, and then another two to three billion dollar bridge already just announced. So, haven't stopped the machine. That's, that's your job. It's Eric's and Lyle's. It's going to be your debt. It takes away choices from you. You might have to take them on.
and you've got not very long to do it in. Here's how insane my generation is about this stuff. This is the land that we saved. This is the stuff that the planners back in the 40s said, if, if possible. And we did for about half a century. And they got their eyes on. What's astonishing to me is that it's land below sea level. So I'm coming from a very rich place, <coughs> British Columbia, and we're rich because if you can get it in a pipe to a port, we'll sell it to the world. Bitumen from the tar sands, natural gas, coal, oil. We don't take responsibility for what we do with it. And we take the wealth we get from it, however, to build this infrastructure, and we're building it to open up land below the sea level. That's the kind of people we are. <laughs> <laughs> And I tell you, I say this all the time, and it just does not register, because how could you accept that about yourself? How could you, how could you look into the world and look at what the risk may be, and then say, the problem with climate change is it's not happening fast enough, and we're here to help. <laughs> and yet, it goes on. So the conclusion I come to, I hate to end on a downer, but I don't see anywhere around it is that the catastrophe that provides that opportunity that led to everything that we built, it really goes back to that flood of 49. Those conditions wouldn't have been quite right. Not the only thing, but it was that particular event that did it. And it will be a catastrophe that will change us. Sorry, I haven't in places like Sandy. When the water literally comes up to the doors of Wall Street, <coughs> and here's the thing, because I don't want to end on a bad one, is that it just opens up this extraordinary opportunity. Right time, right place. And the deal in my generation is, we think you're going to be smart enough. <laughs> We're prepared at least to pay for your education to a great extent. We're raising the cost of that too, but leaving that aside, we really think you're going to be smart enough. And the deal is, is that the resources will be mobilized and the creativity will have outlets if the catastrophe is great enough and resolvable by that combination of resources and ingenuity. And there are a lot of people, Americans are just great at this. I'm thinking, yeah, we'll take that one on. I can't imagine there's none of, I can't imagine there's any of you who don't calculate what those odds are look out into your future. My horizons are limited. I've got maybe another 20 years on this place. I'm going to be around long enough to see how this works out. But I'm thinking, if I were your age, that the extraordinary change that's happened in the last 50 years is going to be more extraordinary because we're going to have to respond to this condition. Where should I be? And my guess is, here. <laughs> this is a great place. You are in the center where the power and the money exist, and they're going to be part of the decision making about how to respond to all of this. You're in a place that is showing its ingenuity. I got the tour today. You are trying. Culturally, it's appropriate. And you have those two or three key things. You've got a place which is in the business of education and research and you have the resources available to apply it. Sounds good to me. So, I'm incredibly pleased, honored, that you asked to come here. A, so I can see it, and B, talk to you about my place. Thank you.